Hello, everyone. I am Onyeka Onyekweli. I'm the Strategic Engagement Manager. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers today delving into discussions around the role that Lottie played to support London local government COVID recovery, but also considering what comes next for London's local government. But before we get into any of that, we'd like to share a little bit of housekeeping um, just to say that we may not be in the same physical room, but we'd like to feel as though we're in the same virtual room. So we have created some cool backgrounds for you all. So if you haven't already done so, please do download the Zoom backgrounds that have been provided and follow those instructions so that we can get that set up on your screens. And we'd also like to see all of your amazing faces. There's no point you joining us for a party if you're hiding in the corner. So please do turn your cameras on and stick those smiles on your faces as you can see Eddie's doing over there. Um, and we'd like to keep that on for the duration of the event, but please do keep your microphones off if you can, thank you. Um, and for anyone who's been at any one of our workshops or network meetups, you'll know that the chat is where it's at normally, um, but today we'd like you to keep it a little bit quiet. So please refrain from using the chat function. Um, however, like any real event, if you'd like to turn your attention away from any of the panel discussions and whisper to someone beside you, you can use the DM function during the event. And lastly, if you have any technical questions, please do feel free to ask James or Monique, who are in the chat here to solve any of your problems. But let's get this event kicked off. Okay, well, we are joined by Mayor Philip Glanville, who is the Mayor of Hackney and Digital Champion for London Councils. And if you don't mind my saying, one of our greatest ambassadors on social media, you are always supporting all of our projects, amplifying our outputs and never failing to really challenge our ways of working to ensure that we remain connected to the residents' needs. So please do join me in welcoming Mayor Philip Glanville to the stage. Welcome. Thank you. That, that's a far too kind introduction, as I always say. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be digital champion and so involved in Lottie. And I can I wish you uh, all as a Lottie team uh, a very, very well-deserved happy birthday. And it's great that we come back together on an annual basis like this because um, I might retweet and I might champion, but I'm only retweeting and championing probably about 5% of the amazing work that you're doing because you just can't keep up. Uh, and I'm, I think that's one of our strengths. You don't have to be on top of everything, part of everything. This is a really iterative, distributive power model of delivering change and collaboration in public services. And that's what I think makes Lottie unique. It is, uh, as others have said, and Theo's uh, firmly familiar with the origin story uh, of, of Lottie that goes all the way back to before my involvement. I, I reflect on a session that we did in 2018, I think with Accenture, with the, the sort of uh, Omid and some of the people that were thinking about what could Lottie do. It was in the shadow of a major football tournament after LJ conference. Uh, and I think there were a few, few tired, tired people in that room because of all of the uh, celebrations and commiserations around the football. But actually people were like so open to a different way of working. And then there was the fear, well, will that survive an actual organization? And it absolutely has. Uh, and we've grown. This is the this is a, a second year celebration, but Lottie has continued even in a crisis year to grow and be able to do even more uh, around digital services. And what you said, Anika, on the video about the citizen, you know, we've always had in our mind, we're not just here to serve the boroughs or to serve the business community or the people that collaborate with us, but the citizen end of what we are doing is so important and, and real people and real collaboration. I also say none of us went looking for the crisis that we're still in 15 months on. But if there was a part of London's kind of infrastructure that was ready for a crisis like this, again, I think Lottie is the type of organisation because it is looking at what challenges boroughs are facing, how we use data, how we can collaborate in a different way uh, overnight. And I'm just going to take us back to what Hackney sort of faced during this year, but there will be something in here that I think anyone from a London borough or any part of London's uh, local government would recognise. And that is the you know, standing up of a humanitarian response on, on new platforms, new services literally having to be produced out of uh, collaborations across our organisation. So bringing in public health, customer services, 
benefits, the VCS, um, the NHS, all of the different parts of the NHS, volunteers, uh, and so the humanitarian response, testing, vaccine delivery, um, how do you deploy volunteers out into those networks? All of that required strong digital services to support them. They weren't necessarily digitally led, but they were underpinned by the type of work that Lottie has done. And I think some of the ideas that we're taking into the next year, our third year, uh, really do have their origin uh, in, in this work. And that, that empowering nature of how we want to use technology and data to improve our residents, especially our most vulnerable residents' lives, I think it's been proved during the pandemic and, and, and lockdown. I'm really pleased that even despite the challenges that Hackney's face, we've been able to play our part uh, in that work. And Zoe's going to talk more about our collaboration with Hackney and Newham uh, in a second. So I don't want to steal uh, her thunder. I think the recovery mission that Theo mentioned as well, the trust that the GLA and London councils are putting in Lottie and the way that Lottie thinks about problems and then solves them, uh, that investment is absolutely critical. But to see Lottie leading it, I think is really powerful because it is a real validation of this way uh, of delivering and collaborating around services. And I often say, if more parts of London's a local government system was like Lottie, I think we could achieve uh, a lot more because of that powerful peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, uh, support. Uh, we, uh, as many people know, Hackney, not just impacted by uh, COVID, but had uh, the cyber attack uh, last October. Huge impact on our services and obviously, the, the way that we've had to recover and build. But I think Lottie has a real strong uh, role to play on helping us move on from our cyber attack, but also building that cyber resilience across all of uh, London's public services and sharing that information about how we protect and enhance the stability of the platforms that our citizens uh, rely on. I've, I've got a new job in the space of the last year. I chair London Council's uh, Transport and Environment Committee and uh, almost instantly started to talk about how data could improve our work across transport and our response to climate change, rethinking what is a green job and thinking about the role that tech can play uh, in, in that and the digital and data skills that truly responding to the climate emergency and our aspirations are gonna take and the EV uh, infrastructure work and making that as open to citizens, borough decision makers, uh, commissioners and private uh, industry around new investment, I think has even more potential, but also another example of how the real world problem, uh, Lottie is helping uh, solve it. Uh, the innovation funding, uh, the innovation fund, also really exciting to be able to do that, to be able to get that money out the door and make sure that we're having an impact for some of the most vulnerable Londoners. Um, again, incredible. My five minutes is nearly up, but I would say if you're new to Lottie or even if you've been with Lottie for its whole journey, keep engaging, be as excited as I think the team are, make sure you amplify not just the work that you might be a part of, but some of that other amazing work that you haven't seen. Follow the week notes, the Twitter, the iterative work, uh, and ultimately we're all in the business of making sure that we use data in a really intelligent way, uh, as Eddie has said. So what an incredible second year always as excited to hear about what's going to happen next. And I think today is going to be a really great event bridging those two things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Glanville. Thank you. Those are some kind words that you said about the team, but also all those that we've worked with in year two. So thank you. And yes, one of Lottie's priorities in year two is supporting London boroughs who are thinking innovatively about how they can support their residents to benefit from the opportunities presented in the digital world. So thank you, Mayor Glanville. And now we'll hear from three more amazing speakers on a panel that's being chaired by my colleague, Genta Hadri. Genta is Lottie's program manager and has led on the delivery of our digital projects from funding two assistive technology pilots in both Hackney and Greenwich, but also project managing our digital projects as part of the COVID Innovation Fund. So I'll hand over to Genta to take over for this next panel. Thanks, Onyeka, and hi everyone, and welcome to the very first panel of the day. Um, so in this rapid session, we're going to talk about COVID recovery, and I'm really pleased to be joined by three people who've been instrumental in that work. They are uh, Zoe Tindall, Change Support Team Manager at Hackney, Rhoda Phillips, Digital Inclusion and Talent Lead at Westminster, 
and Theo Blackwell, Chief Digital Officer for London. So to start off, let's come over to you, Zoe. Um, Hackney, like many other boroughs, have had to rapidly adapt in light of the pandemic. You know, we've seen how this led to a massive shift in the ways of working with internal services and partners. Please, can you tell us a bit more about this and the recent work you've done alongside uh, Newham colleagues on a lottie funded project where you were testing better and more sustainable ways for supporting vulnerable residents and ultimately preventing them from reaching crisis? Over to you, Zoe. Sure. Thanks, Kenta. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a bit of a background to where this came from, um, maybe, and then I'll say a little bit about how the work with Lottie was really useful in developing our thinking. Um, so, so as the mayor and others have said, like the, the scale of innovation, I think, in the first national lockdown was incredible. And, and, and to watch local government, you know, at a time when big supermarkets couldn't work out telephone shopping, and, and, and we had collectively, I think, in Hackney delivered 22,000 food parcels, during that first lockdown was was I think a really useful reminder to lots of people in our organisations that we do have enormous ability to flex and innovate and, and work quickly. Um, so, but my role was supporting a customer services team who, at the end of July, when we stopped doing those food deliveries, it was to step down nine thousand households. You know, many of whom either were really struggling to afford food or, or, or weren't comfortable yet to leave um, their houses. So in order to sort of support that team to be able to have those really, really difficult and important conversations, we put in place lots of different um, sort of tools and support for them. So um, we looked at a digital tool that was helping them to make referrals much more easily to voluntary sector organisations. We looked at different uh, training modules for them and um, peer support sessions to support with the sort of well-being that you know they were they were doing all this very very difficult work all from their own kitchens um, and and as we did that over the year lots of other teams came to us and said oh can we access these things that you're you're doing to support the customer services team as well and and so it was a really nice sort of genuinely agile process where we were responding to need and, and developing these things and I guess we we saw the COVID innovation fund that Lottie was advertising sort of at the beginning of this year and and there was a blurb on that about how you know the pandemic was an opportunity for innovation not just a challenge and that really um uh that really resonated with our experience and I think what was really really useful about the Lottie um project is that it whilst those genuinely agile processes are, are, are really great to be a part of I think you do need a, a moment to sort of stop and pause and and formalize some of those um, interventions that we'd be making and and in particular what what this funding enabled us to do was commission an evaluation from UCL to really understand how we might take these things in this pandemic year and, and use them going forwards to all of the sort of preventative early intervention working that we know is is critical um, all year round but also the chance to work with, with Newham that was the other thing I think we you know we're all a bit guilty I think of thinking that the world ends at our borough borders sometimes. So being prompted to go out and talk to some other um, councils and have a conversation with Newham and find that they were obviously doing the exact same thing as us and were facing the exact same challenges um, was, was brilliant. And we got so much benefit from, from working really closely with them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're really looking forward now that we've, we've got this work and the evaluation um, with UCL done to really think about how we can expand our preventative working across the council because we know that next year we'll need that as much as, as last year. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Zoe. Um, that's really, really great. And the first thing that stands out from you, what you've just described to us is just the huge amount and the varied effort from your team and other teams within the council. And, you know, we're really, really delighted to have been part of your and Newham's journey. The second thing um, is just a huge amount of change the organisations have had to go through um, in this pandemic. And one change we as individuals have had to deal with is that of conducting much more of our lives online. So this has meant that those with limited or no digital skills or access to devices and connectivity, they may have struggled uh, to access services and also to keep in touch with their family and friends during what has been a really difficult time. Um, so over to you, Rhoda, now. So in your view, what has the pandemic taught us about understanding and responding to these needs? 
Um, for us in, in Westminster, and I think also with this will be very similar to other boroughs, is that there were three key things that really um, came out in terms of digital exclusion during the pandemic. One thing is that there are certain groups in our communities that are more digitally excluded than others. In, and, and this was set out in national, you know, national research, but this has actually been really validated during the pandemic and, and factors that lead to exclusion are like age, deprivation and disability. So that was the first one. And the second one is that the digital needs of these digitally excluded groups are multiple and complex. And this ranges from, you know, the infrastructure needs like connectivity and access to devices, but also more importantly, there are like the softer aspects of exclusion and, and like the digital skills and the confidence as well. And the third one is also um, to be able to really support the digitally excluded groups, we really need tailored and targeted interventions. So in this way, we're able to really target and, and really make an impact in the lives of those who are excluded. So those were the three things really that we found out in, in, in the um, during the pandemic. And, and from Westminster's um, experience is that when the pandemic hit, we were very quick to respond to those that are, that, and, and deploy support to where it was most needed. But as a council, we knew like, you know, there was a really strong push from our cabinet, from our executive leadership team. And, you know, from Aruch, who's our chief digital innovation officer, was also, you know, member of LOTI, but um, that there, there is a strong need to really understand. And if we want to make a sustainable impact in the lives of our citizens, we really need to have a really good understanding of the extent and nature of exclusion in the communities. And you know, um, and and that started our mapping mapping journey, and and how we can use um, smartly, uh, how can we use data smartly and innovatively, and and we looked at national and local data sets, and and map the key groups are as to who are affected, but also um, where they were in the boroughs. Um, this also led us to really also go and reach out to our communities and really understand the needs, and that was that led us to persona persona research. And then the COVID funding, the lot of COVID innovation funding came and it was really timely and it was extremely valuable to us. And that has really, um, you know, it has helped us validate what we were doing, but also it has improved. It has helped us scale up this, this, this project of ours and, and, and the pleasure of working with the, you know, our multi-borough partners like, you know, like Sodic, Brent, Barnett, RBKC, and even with Lotti. And, and it was just like, you know, the expertise and the shared learnings. It was really, it's really made that project really meaningful for us and, and, and the fulfillment of being able to scale that up as to like into like Pan London where other local authorities has, will manage to be able to replicate and also help, we are able to help them in their journey. So that's really what it is for us. And, and you know, where are we going next with this and how are we going to be able to, um, what's the next big step? And, you know, the digital exclusion map that we've built with Lottie and GLA and the rest of the boroughs, um, we, we have that data now. And I think the next big thing is that we need to move towards developing a sustainable and effective way of supporting those digitally excluded. And, and we know that we cannot tackle this alone. There's no single borough, no single organization who can do that on its own. And I think that's, that, that's the next step into like wanting what, what's, what's next for this project. And, and I've talked about, you know, multiple and nuanced um, needs of, of, of digitally excluded groups. And I think this is where, you know, we need to really use the data and then, you know, pull resources and pull expertise from all of other organizations and LAs and, and, and tackle the um, digital exclusion challenge together. Thank you. Thanks, Rhoda. Um, it's really, really good to see um, and to hear about all the depth and breadth of the work you've done in really understanding digital exclusion and also the collaboration with, with other boroughs. And we hope that the outputs of this project will benefit other boroughs in understanding you know, who's most in need so that they can better target interventions. But so far, we've heard about two great local initiatives uh, from boroughs, and I'm sure there are so many more examples across London. Um, at a city level, there's a lot of activity underway by the London Recovery Board. And uh, Theo, you've been leading the charge on the nine missions that the board is overseeing from a tech and data point of view. Um, linked to this work and something we at Lossy are very grateful for is your support in securing 1.36 million of funding to develop a digital inclusion innovation program. Um, what motivated you to work with Lottie and 
what opportunities lie ahead for London's ambition to build back better? Thanks, Ginter. Um, and could I just say at the start, it's great to see everyone here and just to echo Mayor uh, Glanville's uh, comments at the beginning, um, every um, digital transformation team, every CIO, you are all, and I don't mean to be glib, the unsung heroes over the last year, um, keeping the lights on, ensuring that people could work from home, delivering public services, but at the same time, as we know through Lottie, spinning up innovative new services, triaging needs, just responding to that need as it was arising, uh, just really, really fantastic innovation. And London owes you a great debt, and I'm sure um, that, you know, the work that we do now will place us in, in good stead. Now, turning to digital inclusion, which is incredibly connected with what I just said, we realised during the crisis that digital exclusion was more intense uh, than I think we'd, we'd realised, not just an issue of devices and laptops for school children, which remains to be a big issue, but actually, uh, as Ronan was saying, it's those hard to reach groups. It's actually very, very difficult to do that. So really, from our perspective, um, we, we have to tackle exclusion in London because uh, if you look at just the broader statistics, there are probably about 800,000 people who don't have access to digital skills. But we lack the actionable data to know wh where they are, where they live, how we can help them the most. Uh, we, we need to do this uh, because we need to be more effective in, in digital inclusion. At the moment, there's a whole theatre of programmes right across the city that aren't linked up. So in a sense, we're lesser than some of our parts. We join that together, we can make our initiatives and corporate initiatives much more effective. I sense some frustration, especially from those in the corporate sector saying, well, we want to do more, but we're just missing that link between what we, we can do and the people um, that need help. And finally, as a broader point on equity, um, Londoners want progress and innovation. They say that to us um, when we ask them but they want it to be fair and they don't want people to be left behind. And for my wider work on, on smart city work and, and promoting, you know, the latest innovations, emerging technologies, uh, we can't, we can't do that if we're leaving people behind. And that's what elected representatives firmly say to us as well. So we need to focus on digital skills. So Lottie is a key instrument in us delivering that. I don't think we could have even come up with uh, uh, the program in the last few months um, anywhere near it at City Hall uh, uh, alone. We have to work very closely with boroughs and Lottie is the vehicle for us to do that. So the programme, which joins two big initiatives that we're already doing, Connected London, which focuses on infrastructure and uh, working with telecommunications companies, adult skills, so we're providing basic digital skills entitlement for every Londoner, and then Lottie's innovation approach, which starts off by focusing on data, we can start to see instead of three separate programs, one program that can, that can look at digital inclusion now more as a service rather than a collection of initiatives. And that's my ambition. I think Lottie's work on data, its capacity with design, its links with the boroughs, um, I think we can get there. Thanks, Theo. Thank you very much for that. As you say, there's a lot, a lot of work still to be done, but we are very, very uh, grateful for your vote of confidence and, and we are really excited to work with you and all London Borough colleagues on developing a really meaningful and impactful programme. Um, just to say that we are uh, out of time, I'm afraid, but just to say a very a huge thank you to all the panel members for sharing their thoughts and also for their uh, hard work and dedication. The Lottie team and I are really proud to have worked with such inspirational colleagues and look forward to more collaboration in year three. Um, now the panel is going to step off the virtual stage and handing over to my colleague Onyeka. Yes, I'm off here. Well, hello. Thank you so much, Genta, Zoe, Rhoda and Theo. That was really interesting um, finding out what we've been able to support you with on a more practical, tangible level um, and understanding the context in which you work in. We've really benefited from that 
hearing about that in the panel. Well, now over to you guys. We want to hear a little bit more from you. So you're not just here to be faces on our screens. We want to hear your opinion as well. So a poll will pop up shortly on your screen. We want to know what area you think should be the highest priority for London local government over the next year. And you'll have three options. The first will be whether it should have been targeting interventions to support digitally excluded residents. The second option is developing more effective ways for boroughs and their partners to collaborate on innovation projects. And the third is securing wider investment in local government programs. I'll give you a minute or so to cast your vote and then the results will pop up. Just waiting a second. I want to cast my vote as well. Okay. Can we bring up the results? I'm not sure. It's coming. Great, okay, the results are in. Apparently it's option number two, which is developing more effective ways for boroughs and their partners to collaborate on innovation projects. We'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, definitely that's in mind for us, how we ensure that we are com coming up with new and innovative ways for boroughs um, to work with VCS, which is voluntary sector partners, but also the wider public sector and private as well. So that's definitely something that's top of mind for Lottie in year three. And we'd like to discuss that a little bit more in our next panel, where we'll be future gazing a little bit with another three amazing speakers. We'll be joined on stage very shortly by my colleague, Eddie Copeland, who's the director of Lottie. Here he is. Um, and he'll be chairing a panel discussion around what comes next for local government. So I'm gonna drop back and let you take over. Thank you very much, Sean Yeka. And yeah, we didn't intend the poll just to quite so conveniently segue into that, but good to hear innovation is on your mind. Uh, if you've seen the video that we released today, if you haven't, please do check it out. Um, you'll remember Emma McGowan there was saying if the first couple of years of Lottie have had you know, by necessity to focus on the technology element, getting the basics right, fixing the plumbing. There's a real appetite, a real ambition in year three to get stuck into the eye of Lottie, the innovation piece. And so really delighted now to be able to welcome uh, three expert local government digital leaders uh, to come and comment on what we might do in that area in the fields of capabilities, new service models and smart cities. We have uh, Omid Shiraji, consultant CDIO to basically everywhere, as far as I can determine. And he's uh, worked in more boroughs than I can uh, name. Omid, pleasure to have you here. We have Kit Collingwood, uh, the Assistant Director for Digital and Customer Services at the Royal Borough of Greenwich, whose recent digital strategy was, uh, regard, was uh, quoted as being the best globally. Please take notes, go and check it out. Uh, it's on uh, the website. Uh, and Steve O'Connor, who is not a CDIO of just one borough, but two, Kingston and Sutton. A real, real pleasure to have the three of you here now. Omid, let me come to you uh, first. You have been working on a project with us, uh, supported by Bloomberg Associates, diving into what capabilities boroughs need in digital data and innovation. You've had lots of conversations in London and with global experts. What have your key insights been? What do you think we could do as a Lottie community to address capability gaps? Thank you, Eddie. Uh, and firstly, just a massive thank you for the privilege of being able to talk on your second birthday. Well, not your second, um, your lossy second birthday. Obviously, you've got the whole Benjamin Button anti-aging thing going, but um, I'm just massively grateful to the borough leaders and partners who've given up their time to work with me on developing this reference model uh, for the capabilities that we need and for what good looks like for digital data and innovation. Um, and if you've had the chance to look at the video or indeed hear me speak anywhere, you'll have probably caught my provocation about the immaturity of our sectors. And as a consequence, we're pretty much making things up as we go along. And that might feel quite polarizing. Um, but I guess one of the major insights that I've had as we work through uh, this sort of project is I think I'm right. Um, there are some really good standards and professional bodies in place on the sort of IT side of the world, but really nothing that's wrapping up that sort of exciting field of data, digital innovation, 
and all those components together. So actually, I think what you're doing for Lottie and what we're doing here is not only sector leading, it's, it's industry leading. So as I've sort of spent time with people and sort of gathered their thoughts and very grateful for their data as well, um, there's probably two or three things I want to highlight. Um, and the first is actually there was massive richness in having the conversation about this stuff. So colleagues I found were sharing what they were doing, what they were thinking as we were kind of defining what these models, what the components were and what the definitions were. Um, so actually just making space for these conversations, not only amongst peers in Lottie Boroughs, but actually with your senior leaders, uh, your political members, um, it's, it's a really important thing to do. And I think one of the benefits of this work is you've now hopefully got a common language to use. To, so you're all sort of talking about the same thing. Uh, I guess the second thing, and this might seem a bit negative, um, but it really isn't when you think about it. As colleagues were working through the model with me, um, I guess I spotted what I could only really describe as sort of self-constraint. Um, and so one of the major benefits of this work is to show all of the stuff an organization might need. But actually I was, I was hearing on occasions colleagues saying things like, oh, we could never do that in, in my borough. We just haven't got the money to do it. It's too expensive or people wouldn't understand it or I've got no idea what that means. Um, and that's why I said it sounds like a negative, but actually if you think about it, it isn't. So I guess a second insight is that um, with this work, we can really help boroughs to understand those components that perhaps they don't understand the benefit of having right now um, and invest in them and those skills that are essential for the outcomes we want to achieve. Um, and I guess that leads me to sort of my third and final insight, which is actually there is truth in what those colleagues are saying, right? So investing in some of this stuff, um, particularly the stuff that isn't proven, is going to be a big risk. Uh, in fact, improving and investing in some of the proven capabilities that are massively expensive is also quite a big uh, challenge. Uh, so things I'd like to call out here, things like, I don't know, the complex and slightly snake oily world of artificial intelligence or machine learning or even things around cybersecurity or how we integrate just an incredibly complex and high volume uh, number of IT systems you get in a borough. There's loads of skills and roles um, and technologies that are needed in those areas, a lot of which are really experimental. And so there's not been enough clarity around benefit or how they can really help to achieve those outcomes. So actually here is a massive opportunity for Lottie and Lottie Burroughs to come and play together. This is the place where I think they can really sort of risk, reap that risk and shared risk and reward um, ethos that Lottie has got and, and really enact the eye of Lottie. Um, and I guess if I've got one more minute. You asked me how Lottie can come together to address these challenges. So this project gives us a common language in the foundation, um, but it enables us to do things like agree roles, agree the skills and standards for those roles, agree sort of common salaries uh, or scales. So we're not poaching each other's um, talent and actually we're trying to invest in the talent um, that like, the UK uh, um, has got a deficiency area. Um, we can invest in building some of those resources together. And actually I think Lottie's got a really powerful role and interesting role to play there. Uh, and, and I guess finally, and really practically, um, it's, it's a call out to, to, to anybody in the community to do things like the amazing kit has done, which is share job descriptions and benchmarking data and operate models and structures, right? And engage in these kind of conversations about what good looks like, because I think all of that together sort of helps us mature this profession. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Lots more of Ahmed's work will be published in the model about what you need on digital data and innovation available soon. But this feels so foundational to almost anything we go on to do, having better, more productive conversations and figuring out together how we address those capability gaps. Thank you for that. Uh, Kit, coming on to you next. Um, welcome any insights you want to share based on all of your recent recruitment activity vis-a-vis -vis what Omar's just shared but I also wanted to touch on with you uh, the subject of new service models I think lots of COVID disruption has really given a renewed emphasis to thinking how might we address community resident needs in different more novel ways 
but this term new services means very different things to different people. I'd love to hear how you and your team think about it. And again, what do you see as being the, the potential of the Lottie community trying to think it through together? Um, thanks, Eddie. I hope the potential of the Lottie community is to tell me how to do it because I haven't got a clue, but I'll share what I think so far. Insights about the last uh, thing that Ahmed said. No great insights. The only thing that's recruiting technologists is a nightmare. Um, and uh, I've had a huge psychological shift away from recruiting talent towards growing it. Um, so not, not that we'll exclusively grow talent, but um, I just can't think of a better way to do it than putting our money more into uh, developing uh, people, things like uh, partnerships with local academic institutions and stuff like that. That's the best way I can think of to do it. We just can't, we just can't afford to do it where we are and not enough people are interested in the sector. So uh, I'm pivoting really radically towards uh, talent pipelines. Anyway, I don't think that really counts as insight, but that was my two pennies for that. Um, new service models. I mean, I think it's one of the most abstract things that Eddie and I and, and people ever really talk about. Um, and I don't think I have any, any great wisdom to share, but I'm really curious at the moment about power shifting. And that really is the heart of what new service models are to me. So going away from the idea that we get a load, like central government gets a load of money from treasury. Uh, they give a load of money to us, you know, too little, but some money to us. We then tax it and then we, we you know, we, the, the, we then do stuff as public servants. Um, that is that is probably just not going to be um, enough in the future because we won't have enough funding and we've learned too much to go backwards. So I think COVID has really shifted how I think about it and how my team thinks about it. So rather than doing stuff at people, doing services at people, I'm thinking far more about doing services with people. Um, and just I wanted to give some concrete examples because this is so... Um, abstract. Um, I'm privileged enough to have um, customer services in my remit as well. Um, and we seconded people directly to our community hub. So out of the council, directly to a voluntary sector organisation that was doing contact tracing uh, back in the day, um, and then emergency support. And then we've gone back to contact tracing. We just gave those people to that organisation without very many questions asked. Um, and we absorbed the performance dip um, in our contact centre for all of the services. Um, so that's one thing we did. Um, things like um, assistive tech, you know, we're partnering with our, our public health team to try and make it so that rather than defaulting to offering um, sort of top down services, care packages, which, is, which make assumptions about, about you as one of our customers, um, instead of moving to a strength based approach and then asking people what technology interventions we might provide that might help them rather than making um, assumptions. It's stuff like our community directory where we, we give um, uh, voluntary community sector organizations access to that so they can upload provision and we don't really do anything with it. You know, we're, we're focused on findability. So we're not doing the service, we're just trying to provide the, the um, platform for it. And finally, some of our digital inclusion initiatives at the moment where we're working in partnership with um, loads of different community groups across our borough and we're just asking them what they need and then we're just giving them what they need and we're not measuring what they do with what they need. And um, so um, I think that's quite scary for a lot of people, just giving. There's, there's, um, when I think about the factors that um, kind of characterise new service models, some of the notes I made are um, humble intervention. So not saying we're going to do this for you, but what, what do you need for us to do? Do you need to take any part in this or should we just back off? and stay away and, and actually you're responsible for outcome. So that's a that's a legitimate thing to do. And I think in these new models, there's generosity. That's another characteristic, generosity of time, generosity of data, you know, giving them the data to act, whoever the them is, or working in partnership with them. Um, and another terrifying thing that characterizes this is that we need to think fundamentally different leadership models. Um, and I'm sorry, not sorry to invoke the patriarchy, but I would say that their leadership needs to go away from patriarchy norms of doing things for people um, and far more towards um, convening, leading from behind or from a networked position and not necessarily from the front. That is terrifying because as, particularly as very senior public servants, we're trained to have the answers and to give the impression of certainty. And this kind of new service model would step away from that and say, actually, we don't, we don't quite know what the answer is here, but we know some people who do and we're going to humbly ask them how we can help. And that, you know, I wouldn't have been so strident about this pre-COVID. We just found out that we didn't know enough to do what we needed to do to get the right 
food medicine to people, but community leaders did, and they didn't trust the council to provide it, but they did trust their leaders to, to do it for them. Um, and then just the last bit, because I'm really terrible with timing, um, some of the enablers of this that I um, wrote down, um, that those new leadership models that don't assume they have the answers, but just encourage curiosity, I think there's a doggedness to it. Um, so I think as a community, we don't have to try and solve this problem. I think it's something we chip away at rather than be like, here's a solution. You know, I just think that's really unrealistic. I think we need to ratchet forward. So where we've made relationships with um, other sectors or partners or councils or whatever, these kind of unusual new ways that we kind of stick to it, we make it sticky. Um, and I think Lottie's role in that is codifying it and building it into patterns so that these are recognisable types of ways of working and we don't feel so freakish in, in doing it. Um, and I think that it's a win-win. So under benefits, I've got a really simple note that just says win-win in massive letters. And by that, I mean, I do think this will make local authorities more efficient and effective because we won't be doing stuff that we can't measurably prove to be the right things, um, while entreat, increasing trust and engagement um, in us by our communities because we will actually listen to them uh, deeply and humbly. I've probably over talked. I'm going to shut up now. Well, so much to unpack there. And I wish, I mean, I think we're going to organise this. We need longer panel sessions because I think the follow on question based on what you said, you're trying to get push power away from traditional power structures, being humble about it, rethinking the role of local authorities um, is also quite threatening to like those working in local government at the moment, many people who've sort of built up their reputation and skill set in particular areas and how we bring them on a really positive journey with us as well as residents, I think is going to be a fascinating one. Your incremental uh, suggestion, I think, is a really, really wise one. So uh, we'll definitely come back to this in earnest uh, over the next year to a very large extent. But let me come now uh, to Steve. Uh, another aspect of innovation that people like to talk about is obviously on the smart city front. In some fields, smart cities have a bit of a bad reputation for being about the flashy tech and about the tech, not about the residents. But it's been really impressive to see your borough's work alongside and um, with uh, the South London Partnership, really trying to use emerging tech genuinely to support some real world citizen relevant needs. Tell us what you've learned about that. And again, to you, what do you see as being the opportunity of doing more of that as a community? Yeah, thanks, Eddie. I, I think when I started in my job, I was probably in that some people category. And I've got a fantastic team working on IoT who have completely changed my mind, actually. Um, and what, what they've done fundamentally is really ground this in real world problems. Um, and that wasn't easy. So there is an element of there's lots of tech out there that you could use, but you've got to find that underlying problem, that real world problem or opportunity to apply it to. And we did struggle with that for quite some time. And, and what changed it, I think, was actually the pandemic. It gave us a focus. So how could we use IoT data sensors to help with some of the challenges that were emerging from the pandemic? And we started with two fundamental areas. One was around recovery and the other was around independent living. And I'll just talk briefly about those two and then how it's sort of expanded from there. So on the recovery one, we knew that as lockdown started to end and we've been around that cycle a few times now, we'd want to understand what was happening in our high streets, what was happening on our roads, what, what were, how we were managing social distancing within, within the community and all those sorts of things. So we frame that with some questions around how will we know movement across the borough? How will we see change? How can we keep our high street safe? And then applied our IoT to that question. So we put movement sensors in that started to track where we were seeing traffic, how it was changing, um, how we were measuring social distancing as well, where there are bottlenecks in, in, in our community spaces that we need to think about, maybe more signage, maybe some marshals, all kinds of things like that. Now, of course, that one now has expanded right out and it's given us, it's giving all kinds of information around use of roads, highways, all of that sort of thing that's informing our, our transport colleagues in the work that they're doing. The independent living one, probably the most powerful one of all, actually, was the one that really did make me realise what, what we could do with this. So it was all around how could we help people who needed to who needed to be monitored and supported in the home in a way that wasn't invasive, 
that took into account it wasn't always easy in those days of lockdown to have people visiting all the time. And we put basically humidity sensors into the home and all they tracked were, was, was the humidity levels in the, in, in, the, in the home. And you could therefore track simple tasks like putting the kettle on, heating, all of that kind of thing and see if anything changed. Very, very quickly, we got we we had one thing that we kind of hoped it would spot, if you see what I mean. We didn't hope this would happen, but we hoped it would spot where somebody did have an accident and actually there was no activity on the humidity. We were able to get a carer in and actually look after that individual. So it really proved that work. But the unexpected benefit when we did this, and this was in February, is we, came, we found a number of cases. We should have known this was going to happen, but we found a number of cases of fuel poverty. And that enabled us as a council then to engage those residents and help they could get around fuel poverty. So what started as something around like the sort of telecare button um, thing where you, you have a problem and you press your button and you get help, it actually then opened up into a whole piece around um, general well-being that we could we could start to help with. But that then moved the whole thing forward and that that whole approach around problem, solving a problem became the key thing. So now we've got how do we solve the problem around fly tipping hotspots in the borough and how do we monitor that? How do we, I mean, there's loads of them. We've got 24 live projects. So I'm not going to list them all because I'll bore you all. And there's another 50 being assessed. Um, but it's, they're all focused on real world issues. Uh, and that's what's been so great. And it's really engaged colleagues in those service areas as well. So they're not technology led, they're problem led. And I think that's really opened it all up and, and moved us forward. The second part of it then is, is how, do, how do we share that and how do we work you know, across the boroughs with it? And I think a lot of the problems we're looking at, and if you take air quality and climate, we've got air quality sensors out there, that air quality does not respect borough boundaries. So we need to be looking at how we can share data and information across London in this. Um, so there's work in the programme looking at the data platforms, the, the data standards that we use, how can we open this up so that we can share that across, my hope is across the lotty boroughs, across all boroughs in London, um, and get the benefit of that data, the richer it is, the more you're able to join things up. Traffic movement being a, a really good example is really powerful. Um, I think the other thing, and we've talked about this, Eddie, is how we share the use cases. You know, we the, the great thing about this program is we've got five boroughs all trying out things. Um, as part of the South London Partnership, uh, you know, piece of work that, that was funded. Uh, there's use cases there can be shared and picked up by boroughs right across Lossie and we're really keen to do that in the coming year. Thank you for that and so so nice and refreshing to see smart cities frankly being done the right way and yes starting with the problem starting with the resident figuring out where tech serves rather than leads so absolute credit to you your colleagues who are a very inspiring bunch uh, and Lottie is going to be doing a lot lot more on helping boroughs and that coordination piece on smart cities and piloting particularly for environmental goals uh, over the course of the next year. Uh, we are now out of time, I'm afraid, but thank you for three really, really uh, thoughtful sets of insights from our three panelists. Thank you, Omid. Thank you, Kit. Thank you, Steve. Look forward to working with you over the next year. And now very pleased to hand back to my colleague, Onyeka. Thank you so much, Eddie, and those kind words. I'm sure you all felt the love, um, the lotty love, as we like to call it. But before we close, we'd like to get your take on a second poll. And this is in light of the conversation that you've just heard between Omid, Kit and uh, Steve. So we'd like to hear your views on which area do you think has the greatest potential to benefit from local government collaboration over the next year. The first option is improving in-house capabilities of digital data and innovation teams, as Omid spoke about. Is it experimenting with new service models, as Kit alluded to, or is it lastly exploring smart city solutions? So I'm gonna cast my vote um, and then we're gonna have the results read out. I feel I need to make the countdown clock sort of tune, but <laughs> I assume people thank me if I don't. Go and grab a drink um, whilst the results come up. We have 72%, but I can't see the results on my screen just yet. Brilliant. Okay, so we have 50% of you think we should 
have um, the greatest, sorry, the greatest potential to benefit from local government collaboration is on improving in-house capabilities of digital data and innovation teams. 35% of you think we should be experimenting with new service models and 15% think we should be exploring in smart city solutions. So that's really useful for us to know. These are three areas that we are going to be to sort of um, channeling our energy in year three. So it's really useful for us to know um, where you think we should channel that energy. But you know, when we come to a second year anniversary, anniversaries are of course sort of arbitrary dates, but they are a wonderful excuse to pause, to reflect, to take stock on, on where we've got to. And I think for me, using this chance to take stock, um, I'm thinking back to where we were this time last year when we had an event similar to this one talking about where we were at that stage. And from what I see, I think our collective confidence has grown as a community. Our reach has grown. We've got a track record of getting things done together. We haven't shied away from the hard stuff. Abundant evidence from all of our speakers today, really trying to get to grips with the most vulnerable, uh, the most profound resident needs in each of our communities. And the way that each of you have supported each other over that time has been really, really profound. I think for me, these are why community matters full stop and why this specific Lottie community matters so much. So I hope each and every one of you on this call, whether you're one of our members, whether you've been one of our supporters, thank you for everything that you have done uh, to be part of that. And I hope you feel that sense of collective pride uh, just as we do. I have some thank yous to say, and I can never say this enough, but first and foremost to our members. So that's to all of our borough members, the GLA, London councils, uh, and on a borough note, very pleased to be able to welcome Murray James and his colleagues from Lewisham as the very latest members of the Lottie family. So Murray, welcome on board. We're very much looking forward to working with you and all your colleagues. Um, in year one, all of our members, I think, took a collective leap of faith with us. And in year two, you've done the hard yards to actually see that model through to prove that it can be really, really worth it. There's a few names I did just want to uh, pick out, um, although I wish I could go through everyone. There's so many things I could say about all of your contributions, but I did want to just give a special mention to Rob Miller and the Hackett team. I think they have had one of the single hardest years in local government, and that is sure as hell saying something over the past year due to the actions of some people whose motives we can, can't even begin to wrap our heads around. The fact that they have been through that, they have remained positive, they have shared, they have contributed and got stuck in with other projects to support the whole Lottie community has been so incredible, such a credit to the whole team. So yeah, a huge, huge well done and thank you to them for all their support. We wish them many more straightforward uh, months ahead. I'd like to mention uh, Paul Neville, who really stepped up uh, to lead one of our hardest areas, innovation and procurement, uh, such a long uh, seated challenge for local government, getting the best possible relationships with suppliers uh, and delighted that he's been able to be so supportive of our work and corralling uh, borough members to do uh, what they possibly can to improve procurement methods uh, and to get uh, the best possible value from the technologies they use. I'd like to mention uh, Yogita from Barnet. Barnet, one of our more recent members, but an example of how you can throw yourself into the deep end of getting involved in Lottie. And she's been uh, leading alongside Sudip Trividi from Camden on our Data Leaders Network, hugely involved in some of our COVID innovation projects uh, and just a constant uh, support uh, on so many of our areas of work. And lastly to Omid, I mentioned he worked everywhere. I think he's the hardest working man in local government. Omid, from before Lottie's origin, during and after, uh, you have been such a support. So thank you for all of that. Lots of organisations on the phone today uh, outside of the Lottie immediate family, whether you're private sector, third sector, private sector, thank you to each and every one of you for the support that you have given us, whether it's been offering skill, skills and training days, connecting us with your networks, being soundboards for advice or letting us speak at your conferences, all of it has been hugely, hugely appreciated. Uh, to our greatest champions, with uh, well, Onyeka mentioned it before, but uh, Mayor Glanville, uh, Theo Blackwell, uh, and Dick Sarabji, uh, Acting Chief Executive of London Councils, have all been enormously supportive uh, of helping us get the maximum possible impact, connecting us with people beyond the technology community. Thank you to each of you for all of your support. 
And last but certainly not least, uh, to my team, Onyeka, Genta and Jay. They're a small team, perfectly formed though, and ridiculously uh, productive. Um, I and they're productive not only because they work blooming hard, it's also because they really, really care about what they do. And it so, so shows. I'm very proud of who you are, of what you do, and of how you do it. Um, keep it up, that's all I can say on that front. But of course, it is a time of change. We are very sad uh, that we will be uh, losing Onyeka from the Lossy family uh, very shortly, but going on to exciting new pastures. Uh, so I'm delighted that Lottie has been a stepping stone to even greater things. Onyeka, we will miss you. We thank you for everything you've done and we're very much looking forward to your leaving drinks. Uh, we will at the, uh, very shortly be recruiting not just for uh, to find some way to fill uh, the very large shoes that Onyeka will leave us, uh, but two new roles. So eventually we will be a six person team and we really look forward to uh, welcoming, uh, introducing uh, those new colleagues to this community very, very soon. Uh, just want to say a huge thank you uh, overall. If you have any form of beverage with you, soft, alcoholic or just imaginary, could I ask you to raise it now to the Lottie community?